those three pieces of evidence right there and add two plus two plus two, you have the U.S. government letting Mutsalab on the plane with an intentionally defective bomb. And then we have the FBI visiting your office uh, a month or so before the State Department admitted that what you'd said was basically true. Unnamed U.S. agency, uh, to be technical, I guess, helped him get the visa and then helped him get on without the passport, uh, to be technical. And you witnessed this, and then the media tried to say, and the government, oh, no, Haskell and his wife, they didn't see this. Then once it lands, they pull you off, claim they find other bombs, clearly other men that were somehow attached to uh, the underwear bomber. All that gets covered up. You're told you didn't see that. Then other witnesses come out on CNN and confirm what you saw. But all that gets swept out of the rug, and this happens. And, when, and within minutes, Chertoff, who didn't tell the public he was making money from it, is on TV saying, don't worry, we'll, we'll put scanners in now that they'd already ordered a year before, claiming they went in because of this when they'd already ordered them and this full TSA hands down the pants you know giant international story this is how they're selling us this and they go out and find mentally ill low-grade morons you and others described him as being kind of disheveled some saying he almost looked drugged uh, I've seen videos of him he looks like he's all probably at a 75 IQ probably retarded uh, and the whole thing is just a giant setup and now he's gonna represent himself and you're a lawyer. I mean, this whole thing looks extremely shady. Is there any way for you to force your way into the trial uh, as a witness? But I guess uh, Mutala would have to call you or the prosecution and say, hey, let's get into real questions. Let's talk about who was behind him. Let's talk about the government getting him on the plane. And th there's not a chance that the prosecution is going to call me as a witness. Now, I have been in discussions with uh, standby attorney chambers and if he has anything to say with it, I'll be one of the main witnesses for the defense. But as you stated, Mutsalab is currently representing himself, so who knows how the trial will play out. It, it's a total crapshoot if someone's representing themselves at a trial. Well, you know, uh, I've interviewed multiple prisoners and lawyers who sued and got the documents and got sworn affidavits from Larry Nichols that McVeigh was told, your family's gonna be taken out, you are special forces, we had you do this. You'll be taken care of if you just go along with it. And I wonder if they're telling the underwear bomber uh, the same thing now because, you know, I mean, I mean, the fact that he doesn't even really speak good English, does he? And, and, and now magically uh, he's going to represent himself. I, I mean, I mean, uh, this is just incredible. I mean, uh, the only way they can keep this from coming out in the trial is to keep you and others from speaking. Yeah, you're probably right. He did have uh, an interpreter at the hearing I was at last week. His English seemed to be fairly fairly good, but he did uh, talk to his interpreter on two or three occasions, so his uh, English isn't perfect. Is he, Kurt, but... is he saying anything? Thank God you've been there. Hopefully you can come back on uh -huh. as this unfolds. I, I, mean, I, I mean, you're the expert on this. I mean, I mean, take us where we need to go. I'm just asking questions that seem rational here, but, I, I, mean, I mean, if I was the underwear bomber, and I'd been led on the plane by people and protected, uh, he should be saying, I was set up, yes, I did it, but the government helped me. I mean, is he saying anything like that? No, not at all. As a matter of fact, most of the, the hearing I was at, about 25 minutes of it, and the hearing went on maybe 40 minutes, was Mutalab and Judge Edmonds uh, basically arguing back and forth whether, whether uh, he was going to represent himself or not. Judge Edmonds insisting that he should have an attorney, and Mutsalab saying, no, 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 I'm representing myself. And this just went on back and forth for about 25 minutes. It was it, the strangest thing. It seemed like everybody watching this in the courtroom just wanted to stand up and say, let Chambers be your attorney instead of your standby. Uh, you know, everyone was on the edge of their seat waiting for Mutsalab to say that, and he never did. And eventually Judge Adams, or I'm sorry, Judge Edmonds uh, gave up on this argument. Uh, but you your point uh, is basically a point that I was thinking of, too. There's only really three explanations why he's representing himself. He's being threatened with something, he's being promised something, or he has such a distrust for the United States system itself due to being duped uh, in this plot that he does not trust an attorney being appointed uh, from the court. So I don't know which of the three, but I don't see 
uh, that there can be any other possibilities other than one of the three, and I don't know which it is. Well, in the last year, as you mentioned, there have been eight cases that we've chronicled here that I know of, of where they go out and find people who are described as morons, normally out of the prisons are recruited directly by the government, contacted by the government out of whole cloth, and directed to carry out jihad with dud bombs. Uh, and uh, clearly here we know that's what happened. The evidence, as you said, is incontrovertible. And, uh, boy, this is really going to hurt the uh, insider's agenda for the police state if it's able to come out uh, what really happened. I agree. The question is, is it going to come out? I really have a hard time believing that it's going to come out. I, uh, until the hearing last week, I was adamant that there would be a plea deal in this in this case and no trial. And now I'm convinced there will not be a plea deal and that this will go to a trial um, based on what I saw at the last hearing. So my question then is how does this not come out? And probably the most logical answer is that Mutsalab rep represents himself and does such a bad uh, bad job of putting on his case that the real evidence doesn't come out. Probably the most likely scenario. I'm sure there would be some others, but um, you know that's pr probably the most likely scenario. What's yeah. going to happen? I know yeah. that in some types of court cases, you can have an amicus brief or, or or someone from the outside who claims they have some type of standing. You're one of the survivors, the victims of this government uh, moron plot, uh, Patsy plot. I mean, is there some legal maneuver for you? Uh, to insert yourself in there? He, uh, I don't think there is, Alex. Uh, nothing that I know of offhand. If there are any uh, legal geniuses listening to this that thinks maybe there is, let me know. Contact me. I don't think there is. Um, uh, you know, I don't think Judge Edmonds would let me be anywhere near uh, Mutsalab as far as representing him. And... Uh, Interestingly, on that point, there was an, a discussion during the hearing, too, that the standby attorney Chambers is having a hard time getting a hold of Mutzlav in the prison where he's at, Milan Prison, indicating on the record that his voicemails are not being given to Mutzlav, his faxes are being thrown away, and he's not getting cooperation and setting up appointments with Mutzlav from Milan Prison to the extent that Judge Edmonds said she would make a call to the prison to discuss it with them. And uh, standby attorney Chambers even saying that he believes uh, Milan Prison got a call from someone higher up, I think those are his exact words, uh, which led to this lack of cooperation. Um, if, if you give me one other second, there's one other thing I, about the hearing I want to talk about. Uh, there was another discussion, quite lengthy, whether standby attorney Chambers would be given the evidence that Mutsalab's originally uh, hired and fired attorneys have provided by the prosecution because he's only a standby attorney. And the government's position was that he should not be given this evidence because it could be uh, subpoenaed or uh, made available to third parties in a possible civil suit against the government, which I thought was kind of interesting that they're concerned about that. Well, that's bombshell. They're trying to yeah. cover up. They don't want anybody to ever hear or, or who has a brain to be able to talk to uh, Mutala. Right. The point being that Chambers is not his actual attorney, so therefore there's no attorney-client privilege. So everything that Mutala tells Chambers, other parties such as myself, an impossible civil, civil suit, could obtain. I thought that was pretty interesting. There was about 10 minutes of the hearing. Spent so that's that an too. admission that they're concerned about evidence uh, that shows that the government is civilly liable. Well, that, that's one way you can interpret it, definitely. They did seem to be concerned concerned about that. I talk radio.com Thursday and Friday at 4 p.m. Eastern for an hour. I created it. It's a totally nonprofit show for those of you insinuating that I did it to make money. It's not true. It's nonprofit. Uh, I don't accept any advertising, and it was formed to let other people that have been disenfranchised with the media discuss topics about government corruption. So something your li listeners might also be interested in. And, of course, uh, the underwear bomber story I've been documenting, documenting on my wife's blog all along since Christmas Day 2009 at haskellfamily.blogspot.com. If you want to read my blog post going back to the start and seeing how everything has come out bit by bit and how my attitude towards this has changed. 
that would be a good way to do it. Well, that was my next point. You've gotten a lot more hardcore now coming right out mm -hmm. and saying clearly, you know, they gave him the dud mm -hmm. bomb. That fits the ML, and that's yeah. what all the facts show. But briefly getting into this other gentleman on the plane. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's there was a man that filmed the whole incident from before it started until after it ended, and he has kind of just gone into the woodwork. No one wants to talk to him. Uh, by the way, Alex, I have his phone number, address, and email address if you want to try and talk to him. Um, I haven't had any luck. I've contacted him a couple of times, and all I get back is a response from his attorney. But I know who he is, and if you want to contact him, let me know, and I'll provide his info to you. Yes, when but, we go to uh, break, uh, we're, stay there. I'm going to get the name and number uh, now, and we'll start sure. calling him. Tell us briefly, we've got about a minute or two left, what you uh, saw. What I saw in what, in what regard? I mean, with this second gentleman. Okay, now I didn't see the cameraman because my view of him was blocked by the bathroom. But what other passengers have said is before the attempted bombing happened, he whipped out a camcorder and started filming. He filmed all the way through it until after it ended. And mind you, this is in the middle of a terrorist attack as our plane is burning. It's bombed and blow up, but it started a fire. And everyone in the plane uh, thought our plane was going down and we we're going to die. So it's highly suspicious that someone would whip out a camcorder, film it all the way through, not put it down, and not only that, but he pulled it out before the incident started. So it's highly suspicious, especially if you look at it in the context of all this other evidence that we have. Uh, you know, it just... It sure, adds, this would point towards a to government it. handler who wants to have the video to scare folks even more on the news and to also help them in the court case. Well, it's highly suspicious. Uh, again, I don't know what person in their right mind, when you think you're going to die, whips out a camcorder. Uh, it's just incomprehensible. Well, some people might do that, but if he's videotaping beforehand, maybe there's right. a reason for it. Maybe, you know, he's a wonderful guy, but the whole thing is very, very... Uh, suspicious, Kurt, and it's clear we're going to need to talk to you uh, again about this very, very soon as the trial uh, of the underwear bomber uh, unfolds. We really want to thank you for all you've done, and folks should check out the Blog Talk radio show, and they should also check out the Haskell Family uh, blog. Uh, and just, again, we're going to put you on hold uh, as this segment ends and get the name and number uh, of the supposed video person. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, that's fine. Um yeah, I think, you know, if any of your listeners are skeptical as to my story at all, ju I would just encourage you to look at all the evidence. There's a damning amount of evidence that shows that my position is actually correct. So don't just look at one piece or two. There's at least 30 different bits of evidence, which I gave to Amy Lang as evidence that, that she requested, Amy Lang being the Fox 2 reporter of the clip that you aired earlier. So there's a great deal of evidence supporting my position on this. The government story is nonsensical, contradictory, and just a flat-out lie. Well, Kurt, you've done an incredible job. I don't even know why you're being defensive a little bit. I mean, you, you, you're a hero. You've been totally proven right. And uh, so what if disinfo people try to lie about you? Folks should go to the website, see the facts for themselves. You and your wife and other witnesses are spot on. And we salute you for defending the liberties of this republic. Stay with us. Okay, well, that's the problem that I found in my life on all kinds of different levels, but especially in about 9-11, and that is that you can have all kinds of information, but if the person that you're talking to has, you know, preset notions, you know, belief systems that they dearly love, that they won't let go of, they won't even look at any of your evidence. And part of that comes around when people get this attitude, I've already studied this so much, I already know what's going on, I don't need to waste my time anymore, I know what's going to happen, I'll look at it and then I'll find the same old stuff that you're either messed up in your head or whatever, so I'm not even going to look. And they wind up just perpetuating the nonsense and they wind up just being just as stupid as ever. And this guy, was, you know, he was being defensive because of that type of thing. Here he is, a lawyer, an honest person, good standing in the community, and they're giving him this type of, you know, disinformation treatment. They're trying to discredit him completely. Well, I don't usually talk much about any sort of politics, but most candidates that you see and the people that elect them 
are, are they, they treat it like it's some sort of a, a beauty show or something. It, this guy doesn't have a voice I like, or this guy doesn't comb his hair right. But every once in a while, somebody comes along that actually talks sense. Now, you, you know, you can talk Ron Paul or Kucinich or Nader, and I like Nader an awful lot. Now, Nader didn't get anywhere because he's about the least dynamic person you ever saw. But here's a clip that we're going to run. This is Ralph Nader.